Hello, everyone, and welcome back to module number one, artifact number five. And today we are going to look at and explore old kingdom burial structures. And one of the things that I hope you'll you'll take away from the next two modules are the ways in which burial structures in Egypt between the Old Kingdom, which we'll look at now, and the New Kingdom, which we'll look at next, are completely different for some very practical and easy to understand ways. Now, in our previous artifact, we only looked at Old Kingdom sculpture, and the reason for that is New Kingdom sculpture, as we'll look at next time, is going to be quite a bit different for some very interesting um, social and political reasons. And burial structures in the Old Kingdom will likewise look different. So as a way to get there, I want to just begin with a map of Egypt, the ancient Egyptian culture. And again, as we mentioned last time, the Egyptian country today is small compared to the great expanse of the Egyptian culture you know, from 3000 to 1000 BCE. Most of the things we're going to look at in this artifact for the Old Kingdom are primarily in Lower Egypt here in the north. You might have heard of Giza before, and the American spelling is usually with an A. That's where the Great Pyramids are, and if you know anything about Egypt, that might be one of the things you know. But we're also going to spend a little bit of time looking at Saqqara, um, and there is a gigantic burial structure there. Next time, when we look at the New Kingdom, we will descend south southward to Upper Egypt, and we'll look at some places like Karnak, Luxor, and Deir el-Bahari, and those, and even Abu Simbel for that matter. And so, so one of the major changes that happens between the Old Kingdom, what we're talking about now, and the New Kingdom next time involves the moving of the focus of the Egyptian culture from Lower Egypt to Upper Egypt. Um, the moving of a, the center of a kingdom actually has um, kind of a tradition within the West. Um, I'll give you one and we'll talk about it in a few weeks time. And that is the idea of the center of Rome moving from Rome to Constantinople in what is now modern day Turkey. Constantine, who moved the empire and named the city after himself, wanted to distance himself from the Roman past while embracing Rome's future. And so he moved the empire. Pretty simple. And this happens with the Egyptians as well. There are three major kinds of old kingdom burial structures. And and one might say a fourth as well, but I think it's three with a gigantic whoops-a-daisy uh, that could count as number four. The first, and what we'll look at early on, are what are called mastabas. They're super old, super simple, and they're super prevalent, and they exist in the thousands. Um, they were the kind of burial structure for remarkably wealthy people, but not necessarily for pharaohs. As time moves on, mastabas are no longer considered grand enough for the, the most powerful pharaohs. And so we begin to see what are called stepped pyramids. Then the final development of this burial structure process is what we call the true pyramids. When you think of a pyramid, this is more or less what you think about. This was not the first kind of burial structure. It took 500 years to develop the, the, the structural format to create that kind of building. Um, and it's only around 2500 BCE that we begin to see those pyramids. So let's get started by talking about mastabas. Everything we look at today is a burial structure. And what this means is that there was the body of a dead person placed in it. Now, we have burial structures in, in the West today, although, although they're, they've certainly changed and are shifting. And, you know, my, my 
my mom's parents, my grandpa and grandma Clark, um, and my mother now, unfortunately, are in a mausoleum um, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is where uh, my mother grew up and where my um, and where my grandparents lived pretty much their whole lives. Um, and in that mausoleum, there is, at least for both of my grandparents, um, a coffin, which I hope contains their earthly remains in whatever state those things might be in, because because um, my grandpa died in 94, my grandma in 2007. Um, but in there are those bodies. And then my mother was cremated. So there is an urn there with, with, with her ashes. But that's it. As far as I know, that's it. Um, in our culture, there's no need to bury people with the kinds of things they use in their everyday life. But for the Egyptian culture, that was very much a part of their burial system. If you were a baker, now, if you were a baker, you likely were not going to have a mastaba, right? That's an extravagant burial structure, but you would have a tomb of some kind, and it might be a shaft tomb, which quite literally is a hole dug in the ground. But if you were a baker, in your shaft tomb would have been placed the kinds of things you would need to continue on with your baking life in the in the afterlife. So, I mean, I say this as someone who is kind of baking bread right now. Um, if I was a baker, what I would need in the afterlife would be my 12 quart dough tub. I would need my digital scale. I'd need my digital thermometer. Uh, I would need the measuring cups I use to measure out volumes of water. Uh, I would need jars of yeast and flour and some salt. I would need my, my easy bake oven. Uh, I need my fancy, I'm a baker apron. I need all of those things because in the next life, I'm going to be a baker too. I mean, I'm a, an art history professor and I guess an associate dean now, but an art history professor. So, so if I, what do I need to do my job? Well, I need my laptop. I need my laser pointer. Uh, I need my cup of coffee and my bow ties. All of those things would be placed in my burial structure. Be that burial structure a remarkably humble shaft tomb or something far more extravagant like a mastaba. The mastaba um, is an Arabic word, and what it literally means is bench. And it look, and if you look at it from the side, it looks like an enormous long bench. These things are big. It's they, they can range from a hundred to a hundred and sixty feet long. That's a hundred sixty feet is about half the length of a football field. So they're really really big. And when they show up with one, they show up in dozens. And what this means is they're they are they're often part of what we call a necropolis. Necropolis is a fancy Greek word for city of the dead, but we can just think of it as a cemetery, right? And the cemetery is filled with dozens of them. And people are often buried. The more than one person is often buried in them. You can think of them as being kind of like a mausoleum, right? The mausoleum where my my uh, my grandparents are buried um, is sort of like a little family tomb, family crypt, where grandpa and grandma and mom all chill out together now. That's the way this works. And what's important to note is that the burial structure is underneath the mastaba. And if you let me go to this side angle view here, you can see one is a kind of door, right? And you can walk in that door and there's a space inside it. This is an overhead view here, but that's kind of a false chamber. It's, you know, you can think of it as being kind of like a reception hall where people will enter to remember the dead, but the burial structure is underneath the mastaba itself. So there is a pathway directly through the mastaba, and then there's a burial structure underneath that. This is not the burial structure. The burial structure is underground. And that will be an important difference compared to some of the burial structures that we will see uh, in Egypt. It's, pardon me, it's, I'm recording this on a Friday morning and I'm drinking coffee. So you hear slurping, that's what's going on. My apologies. I wanna call your attention to these shapes here. There's one there, another there, and a third one over here. And again, mastaba, mastaba. 
and then four more over here. And these are like little pyramids that we'll, we'll, I'll show you in a second. This is actually, this photograph is taken from the top of one of the pyramids at Giza. And so you can see we have this field of mastodons. Now, this, this, um, these, these spaces here, those are for boats. Boats were buried there because people believed that they would uh, sail to the afterlife on a boat and go across the Nile. And so there were boats buried there. And I'll show you one in due time. Now, let's talk a little bit about the burial process for, for the Egyptians. Because there was a Greek historian, and I'm now looking for his book on my shelf, and it's, well, it's across the office, so I'm not going to grab it. But his name was Herodotus. And Herodotus was kind of the the great, great granddad of history. He was writing in the 5th century BCE. And he wrote a couple of things that I think were interesting. One, he wrote that the Egyptians were the most religious people um, uh, it, of all the ancient civilizations. And what I think he meant to suggest, what he meant to suggest by this was that the Egyptians had a god or a deity for just about everything you can imagine. Um, and we talked a little bit about this in our last artifact when discussing Khafre, right? They have a god for the underworld, a god for the sun and the moon, a god for embalming, a god for Thursday, um, a god for the river. You know, everything had a god. But Herodotus also chronicles with great, great clarity the embalming process. Um, that the Egyptians um, undertake for the sake of their um, for the sake of their burial processes, um, and because I'm a go getter and because I have Bluetooth headphones, I actually walked over and got my copy of Herodotus off the shelf. And I'll read you the the part that he writes here. And the, the book he writes is not a straight history of Egypt. It's the ancient cultures very very broadly. And so I got lucky and turned to the page. Um, they are religious to excess, far beyond any other race of men, and the use of the following ceremonies. They drink out of brazen cups, which they scour every day. There is no exception to this practice. They wear linen garments, which, which they are especially careful to have always freshly washed. So they, he chronicles with great precision all of the ways in which they are very, very religious people, and and alas, I don't think I can find the part about embalming, but I'll give you a little bit of the backstory in terms of uh, how they embalm their dead, because, because as their burial structures will make very clear, the Egyptians are keenly interested in the process of permanence. I mean, if you think back to Khafre's statue, Khafre is not moving. And the reason for that is because he, the Egyptians have a sincere interest in the idea of making things permanent. You're in luck because I found the part of the book about embalming. The mode of embalming, according to the most perfect process, is the following. They take first a crooked piece of iron and with it draw out the brain through the nostrils. So they have like a little hook that they shove up through the nose um, and then they kind of rattle it around and pull out all the brain because they don't believe that the brain matter is actually very important. Thus getting rid of a portion uh, while the skull is cleared of the rest by rinsing with drugs. Next, they make a cut along the flank, so the upper part of the body, with a sharp Ethiopian stone. And I bet this is obsidian, which is uh, a, an ignatius volcanic rock that you can hone a, a super sharp edge with. And take out the whole contents of the abdomen, which they then cleanse, washing it thoroughly with palm wine and again frequently with an infusion of pounded aromatics. After this, they fill the cavity with the purest bruised myrrh, with cassia, and with every other source of spicery, except frankincense, and they sew up the opening. Then the body is placed in natrum for 70 days and covered entirely over. Natrum is a kind of salt, um, and it will dry things out. Um, 
then the body is placed in atrium. After the expiration of that space of time, which must not be exceeded, the body is washed and wrapped round from head to foot with bandages of fine linen cloth, smeared over with gum, which is used generally by the Egyptians in place of glue. And at this state, it is given back to the relations who enclose it in a wooden case, which they have specially made for the purpose and shaped in the figure of a man. Afterwards, the body is wrapped in linen and buried. Now, that's the expensive way. And he also chronicles the least expensive ways because all things considered, not everyone can afford the super expensive mode of, of, um, of um, embalming. So they do all of that so that the body has a sense of permanence to it. Permanence, both in sculpture and in structures, is really, really important. Now, I give you this object. It's called the Step Pyramid of Zoser. And we have, at least for, as far as I know, for the first time, the name of the architect. His name is Imhotep. And this was a burial structure created for Zoser. It's why it's his step pyramid. He was a pharaoh in Dynasty Three. Now, when we talked about Naram, I mentioned that he was the beginning of dynastic Egypt. He's Dynasty One. Zoser is Dynasty Three. And we've already looked at Khafre. We'll come back to him in a little while. He's Dynasty Four. This was constructed about 2630 BCE, and it's just outside Saqqara, which is about 30 miles away from Egypt. I mean, if you were to hop on the, 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 the tourism bus, it takes you about an hour to get there. And this, in several ways, is a very interesting burial structure. It's our first kind of pyramid-like structure, but it did not begin that way. As a matter of fact, it originally began as a mastaba. Now, it wouldn't be surprising to you that mastabas are not built up overnight. They actually take like years to make. And so the pharaohs, like almost as soon as they became pharaohs, they began planning their burial structures. And when, when Zoser's mastaba was completed um, and he was still alive and fit, he decided to have it expanded. And so originally it was a mastaba and then they made it another mastaba on top of it. So you can think of this right here, first mastaba, then they put another one on top of it and another one. And in, in a sense, the stepped pyramid is Zoser and this dotted line here suggests the original form of it was essentially five mastabas placed on top of one another. And like other mastabas, the burial structure for it was underneath the original mastaba. So this structure went through a variety of, of, of additions and expansions over the course of a couple of hundred years. And if you look at this sort of diagram of it, this is a bird's eye view here, you can see a couple of things. First of all, this line here is the structure as it exists now. This structure here is the original stepped pyramid. And I call your attention to all of these things, all of these lines here. They look like they're passageways. And in fact, that's exactly what they are. These are grave robbers tunnels into that original mastaba. And the reason for this is really, really simple. If you're a baker, you're going to be buried with all your baking gear. And, um, and that not be, might not be of interest to most people. But imagine you're a pharaoh. Imagine what you're buried with. Nothing for your job, because your job is to do nothing. But you're buried with a lot of gold and bling. And oddly enough, as long as there's been gold, there's been people who want to steal other people's gold because they don't have any. And so quite literally, from the moment this thing was sealed up, people were trying to get inside it to rob it. Um, and that's what all of these tunnels are, are grave robber tunnels 
trying to get inside this structure to steal what's there. There's something else I need to point out about this, and that is the stepped pyramid here is part of an incredible burial complex. Like we often think of this as being the burial structure, and in many ways it is. But the burial process for an Egyptian pharaoh does not have just one building. There's often going to be a mortuary temple. There's going to be a temple court. And there is going to be a place where the, the embalming of the body happens. And then a causeway or road to take him to his interment. Um, it is like... A, it's like a big party of architectural structures to commemorate the life and death of a pharaoh. You know, we often think of of of, um, of deaths as being sort of great moments of sadness, and I don't I don't want to say that they're not. But you know, my mother's family is Irish, and um, at least once in your life, you should go to an Irish wake, because an Irish wake is is. Is certainly a sad event because you're 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 thinking about someone who is no longer alive, but it's also a celebration, hopefully, of a life well lived. And the burial process for an Egyptian pharaoh was very much a part of that. So this is you know your your average National Geographic diagram of what a, a stepped pyramid structure might have looked like with an outdoor courtyard, the burial structure it's, itself, um, and then smaller temples and, um, and structures for um, other members of the family. So all of that is really, really good. Now, as we move away from mastabas, we get to what we consider to be pyramids, pyramids. But, and there are three of those that you might be familiar with, but this might not be one you've ever seen. This is the Bent Pyramid uh, near Dashur, which is 20 miles away from Giza. It was built for Sanifru, who was, I'll, I'll just call him the grandfather, the grandfather of a series of three pharaohs of Dynasty Four. It was constructed around 2575 BCE. It's over 330 feet tall, and it's 620 feet across. I'll pause here to let you be amazed. It is quite literally two football fields across. This thing is enormous, and it is in many ways a natural extension of what we saw with the the, the stepped pyramid, but you can see that when they began constructing this, they built it at a 54.15 degree um, level of inclination. And this thing would have made it super crazy high. And half, I mean, just imagine that line up here. I mean, it would have come up to, up to here, if we think about where those lines intersect. And about halfway up, they realized that that was not going to work. And so they changed it to 43 degrees. And when we look at the, the true pyramids, you'll see that that is a, a, much, a much better degree of, of elevation for, uh, for a true pyramid. There are two distinct burial structures in this. One is underground, kind of like a mastaba, and a second that is within the, um, the bent burial structure itself. You'll see here the phrase corbelled vault. There's one interior there and one underneath the ground. I'll say a little bit more about corbelled vaults in a second, but essentially it allows architects to create hallways, um, and that will be really important. This, this pyramid was originally supposed to be meant for Sanufru, but when it ended up being, I don't even know how to say this, not perfect, they decided to abandon it, they completed it, um, but just left it unoccupied. And so it's this very bizarre, um, unoccupied pyramid in the middle of the desert. Um, and, you know, a long time ago when looking for images, because I've never been here, when looking for images on Google, 
I found uh, the the travel blog of a British sailor who posted all of these photos. Uh, and so I emailed the guy and said, hi, my name is Brian and I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland. Um, I, I love your pictures of Sanufru's Bent Pyramid. Can I use them in my class? And he wrote back, he said, absolutely, I'm delighted. I only ask that you show a picture of me when you do so. So I am going to keep my end of the bargain, and I have since the fall of 2005. Uh, you can see here, Bent Pyramid, True Pyramid from Giza will give you the idea of how close these structures are to one another. These things are made from gigantic bricks. I mean, gigantic heaves of, of stone made out of limestone. They all weigh about two tons each. And so think about the labor that goes into the construction of these objects. It is absolutely dazzling. Um, and, and, you know, I, and I was once talking with an Egyptian an Egyptian woman who I met in graduate school. And I made a kind of snarky joke. And I, of course, I was not serious. Um, I made a snarky joke about, um, about these having been built by aliens. Because there's like all of this, you know, history channel, like, doc, like who's the, the guy from uh, Star Trek, like Dr. Spock, who he, like Leonard Nimoy is his name. He like narrates these about how, you know, we don't really know how they built these. And so aliens must have done it. And so I made this comment to my friend Ozma about aliens having done that. And she looked at me as if she was going to rip out my trachea. And she said, Brian, the pyramids are the only thing that people care about in Egypt. And for you to suggest that the Egyptian people were not smart enough or industrious enough or inventive enough to create it is the most insulting thing you could ever say to an Egyptian. And she didn't even finish the sentence before I was trying to apologize. Um, aliens didn't build these. And just because we don't know exactly how they do it, did it, says something more impressive about the Egyptians than maybe first we realize. I promised you Richard Seaman, which I think is the best name ever for a British sailor. Um, here he is in front of the Benton Pyramids. And if you're wondering, Yes, I think he's wearing a t-shirt with sharks on it, which I really, really like. So this is the Bent Pyramid. It's a kind of first, let's try to get it right pyramid. It didn't work out so well, but that's okay because eventually the Egyptians get here. I sort of mentioned that Sanufru is kind of the grandfather, but in reality, he's kind of the great grandfather. He's the beginning of Dynasty Four, and he had three sort of ancestors or progeny, I said maybe a better way, um, who all had true pyramids. You saw his own, there it is. But his son, grandson, and great-grandson all had their own pyramids. And here they are, complete with local neighborhood scale figures here in the foreground. You've met two of these people already. You met Kafre, you saw his Ka statue, and you met Menkare and his wife, and you saw their Ka statues as well. Here you go. These structures were intended for these burial structures. This is where they were placed in the afterlife so that their spirits could reside with their bodies until it was time to go to the, to the afterlife. And so this sort of National Geographic diagram makes a couple things clear. One, we're dealing with different sizes. It's maybe not surprising that, that the, the youngest of the three had the smallest. Um, but we also have long causeways that lead from a mortuary temple to the pyramid. And the same is true here. This field over here those are those necropolis, necropoli, necropolis, right? That's the city of the dead filled with mastabas and little pyramids often for queens. Um, over here is the Great Sphinx. The Great Sphinx was kind of a garter of this, uh, of this structure. 
And here you can see her now. She has been restored in some ways. They did this in the 1980s where they redid the front part of her paws um, and part of the hind end. Part of this has been carved from living rock, which means she's not really a large scale structure that has been completely constructed. She has been almost carved. And there's been some suggestions that over the course of you know, 10,000 years, this small hill was carved away by the, by the wind, which certainly happens with wind and erosion. Um, and then she was um, uh, uh, modified to make her, him look like the Sphinx. So the Sphinx is an Egyptian kind of mythological beastie that has the body of a man and the head of a lion. Although we often think of Sphinx as being female, she has been carved, historians believe, with the head of Khafre. You can see she has the, uh, the headdress here of an Egyptian pharaoh. And there's always been this suggestion that um, her head was used for target practice by Napoleon's army in the early 19th century. Although I've never read anything that uh, historically that suggests that this is true. I mean, Napoleon had no interest in destroying Egypt. He wanted to bring things back um, for it. There's a reason why when you go to the Louvre in Paris, and you should, there's a whole bunch of Egyptian stuff because Napoleon went to other places with people who didn't look or think like him. He stole it and brought it back. It's why the Rosetta Stone ended up in, uh, in, in Paris to begin with. So here are those three pyramids and the smaller um, pyramids here. And again, the scale of this here is much smaller than this one, much, much smaller, although the distance between them uh, makes it seem like it's bigger than what it is. It's the bigger, it's the one that's closest to us, but it's also, as this makes clear, by far the smallest. Originally, the pyramids were faced with glimmering limestone. And so if you were to think about what pyramids look like, um, imagine, gosh, and I have kids now, I could do this with Legos. Imagine it being built with Legos, right? So if you follow my magic cursor here, Lego, 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 right? That would be kind of how we think about it. But originally, that space between the Lego, this kind of L shape, a glimmering piece of limestone was cut in to fit with that. You can see some of that here. And so originally, rather than all Lego-ish, it was a gigantic slide. I mean, this has been the greatest water slide ever. Whoosh, down you go. But over time, that stone has been quarried away for all kinds of other purposes. I mean, over the course of 4,500 years, a lot gets stolen. And so there's not a lot that survives of that original very bright limestone covering. And originally, there was supposed to be the peak was made out of 500 pounds of pure gold. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that's the myth we get. I give you here the relative sizes of those pyramids. Khafre, um, who again is the 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 is like the grandson, so like or grandson or uh, grandfather, pardon me, grandfather, son, grandson, right? So generation one, generation two, generation three. And the distance and height between them is kind of staggering, right? The between granddad and his son, they're pretty close, right? 480 feet and 470 feet are pretty close together. Um, and you get the idea that that at the end of Dynasty Four, um, that things are beginning to slip a little bit. Now, it could also be because Menkare died younger than Khafre and Khufru, and that absolutely could be part of the, the deal here. You can see that the angle of inclination here is 52 degrees. 52 degrees, although it seems very close to 54 degrees, made the managing of height of this a much more realistic option. And when we look at the diagram of this, you can see the ways in which this structure is fundamentally different than what we had with either mastabas or the stepped pyramid. Remember, with both of those structures, the, the, the burial structure was not in the work itself, but underneath the ground. And here with these pyramids, the 
the body is interred inside the structure itself. You can think of this as being a big solid um, bit of architecture with a large scale chamber here or gallery that leads us to what we just call the king's chamber, although that's where we believe everything was placed. And then there's a smaller chamber here. We call that the queen's chamber, but it's just a made up name. There are rather inexplicably some, some um, chambers here that go to the surface. We call those air shafts, but we don't really know why they're there. Leonard Nimoy would tell you that it serves some kind of architectural um, or not, astronomical function. And you can see that there are things here underground as well. Because the tradition for old kingdom burial structures was to bury the good stuff underground, they put something underground and buried some things in there, believing that grave robbers would probably find that, take that, and believe that there was nothing else. And the original stuff was originally placed here. These, of course, were looted just like everything else. And the things that could be melted down, like gold, were completely melted down. And the things that can't be melted down and you really can't do anything with them like gigantic cost statues actually survive. Now, one of the things that's interesting is when I became fascinated by Egypt when I was a wee little kid, I learned the Greek names for these Egyptian pharaohs. And one of the things that's happened between when I became fascinated with Egypt in 1986 and when I took, you know, my first art history class in 1994 um, was that uh, art historians thought it was only proper to call Egyptian pharaohs by their Egyptian names rather than use their Greek names. But here you can see those Greek names, Mycerinius, Kephron, and Cheops. But here you can see the, a diagram of this remarkably complicated burial structure and the city um, that is surrounded all around it. I mentioned to you a little while the idea of corbeling. And corbeling is one of the most basic architectural principles that allows you to create a hallway. And in creating a hallway, what we have are ever so slightly overlapping stones um, that they overlap a little bit and a little bit and a little bit until eventually you get to a top and you can bridge that top with a kind of capstone. And these hallways through here have that kind of corbeling. This is a diagram of a corbelled arch, and the Egyptians don't invent it, but they very much use it to new purposes. Um, and and one of my former students, uh, just a, a wonderful young lady named Tessa Chris, uh, did this with uh, Indiana Jones on it because I'm such a fan of Indiana Jones. And so this is a corbelled arch, and it allows you to make a big expanse from here to here even though you couldn't make a post and lintel arch. So hooray for all of that. I bring your attention back to an image I showed you a little while ago because we had these smaller little queen's pyramids here. You can see them right there. And then you can see these things here and one over there. And I told you that those were boat pits. These boat pits um, survived, and because the Egyptians put wood into a dry desert, those boat pit those boat pits had boats in them, and this is what they look like. With some modern restorations, I grant you, but by and large, they are in remarkably good shape because wood, if you put it in something dry, is not going to rot because, well, you need rain for it to rot in Egyptian to Egypt. As this picture makes you seem, think, doesn't get a whole lot of rain. And so these boats, these extravagant boats were intended for the, the pharaohs and their queens to make their way to the, to the afterlife. And this is how they rolled. As you should be unsurprised, here's your obligatory picture of a GW student riding a camel um, in front of the pyramids. And one of the pictures that Aaron sent me, and I'm just so delighted to have it, is this one. This over here is a picture of the 
of the pyramid complex at Giza taken here from the second story of the Pizza Hut in front of it. And so in front of the pyramids at Giza is both a Kentucky Fried Chicken and a Pizza Hut, which just makes me feel sad. I found this picture, I don't know, like 20 years ago, and I always thought it was funny. And I, and I kind of ask you, what do you think this guy is thinking? Or better yet, what do you think he was thinking 4,000 years ago? Because I bet what he was thinking is, how can I loot those pyramids? <laughs> this is not the most subtle um, of, uh, of burial structures, is it? And imagine if you were wanting to go rob someone's house. Like, let's say you're a bad person. Your name is Bob. Your name is Bob. You're a bad person. And you want to go rob someone's house. Well, there's all kinds of ways in which you could determine which house to rob um, if you really wanted to get some good stuff, like high-end watches or jewelry, nice TVs. And part of it might be you would walk around until you found a house um, with, I don't know, like three BMWs and a Mercedes Benz parked in the driveway. Like you have a better sporting chance of finding a, an Omega watch or a Rolex watch in that house than you do in, in front of a house um, that has a, a, a 78 Honda Accord. This is the BMW of burial structures. It's not exactly hard to find. You know who's buried in there. It's not you know, Osama the baker, it's, it's Khafre the pharaoh. And because you know who's buried in there, there's an expectation that there's going to be great stuff in there. And because there's great stuff in there, and because your name is Bob, and because you're a dishonest person, you're thinking, holy smokes, I'm going to go rob it. And this reason is why we have very few artifacts from the burial structures of old kingdom pharaohs because this guy right here his name is bob bob and his other friends like stephen and john all busted into this into this uh pyramid and stole all the good stuff the things that were made out of gold they melted it down and made a necklace or sold it or did something so as it pertains to old kingdom burial structures, there are very few things, very few artifacts placed in them that survive. There are some things, right? Khafre statue is one of them. And Minkari statue is one of them. But mostly because you can't sneak that out, right? If you're going to go to a, a big house and steal things, you're going to steal a watch because you're going to put that watch in your back pocket and walk out the front door. You are not going to steal the 78, 70 inch 4k TV because that takes you and three friends and it's kind of hard to sneak away out of the house carrying a 70 inch TV. So some things survive, some things vanish. They're gone. And when we get to the new kingdom, we are going to find a different method for burying Pharaoh so that things might survive a little bit. And that will be the focus of our next artifact, artifact number six.